Well, hello, and welcome back to chapter five of By the Great Horn Spoon. Mr. Phillips here, reading to Mr. A Mrs. Eddie, Mrs. Eddie's wonderful fourth grade class. Um, last we left, that pig and that thief got away. And I think they were in Rio de Janeiro. You guys remember this map? Here's the U.S. And, you know, these guys are coming out of Boston. And they're coming down here. And they're going around South America. Well, they've made it all the way down to South America. I wish I had a better map. And here's South America. And there they are. They've come around here, they're off the coast of Brazil, and they've made it to Rio de Janeiro. But today, they're gonna go around the tip, the horn. That's some rough seas down there. And I don't know if you can see, but it's all broken up down there at the bottom of the cape. Let's see if we can find a better map. Here it is. It's called Tierra del Fuego, the land of fires. And you can see, you gotta go all the way around the tip right to make it up the other side of argentina and chile but if you look real carefully there's water in there i wonder if anybody would ever be brave enough to go through there and cut off the bottom of the tip it wouldn't be as far you could go a little quicker it's called the straits of magellan more on that later as our heroes go through tierra del fuego the land of fire here we go Chapter 5. The days grew shorter. The Lady Wilma beat her way toward the tip of South America, and summer faded quickly from the sea. Jack, who had been going barefoot for weeks to keep cool, now put his shoes on to keep warm. See, they've moved from the northern hemisphere to the equator, and now they're going down way down into the southern hemisphere, and by the time you wrap around the bottom of South America, Tierra del Fuego, land of fire. It's cold again, because you're close to the South Pole now. Jack, who had been going barefoot for weeks to keep cool, now put on his shoes to keep warm. The gold seekers put away their straw hats and dug in their sea chests for woolen underwear. Off the coast of Patagonia, Jack awoke to find six inches of snow on deck and a school of sperm whale off the starboard bow. Soon the passengers were bundled up in great cocoons of clothing. Thin men looked like fat ones, and fat men looked enormous. For days, Praiseworthy and Jack watched the crew tighten the riggings and check the canvas against the coming winds and crashing seas of Cape Horn. An air of impending adventure, adventure ran through the ship. Jack listened to the tales of whaling ships disappearing forever from the roaring Cape of square riggers with their masts uprooted like trees, of brigs driven back by horrendous headwinds and barks wandering in endless fogs. Nonsense, Praiseworthy would say, mere sea yarns. A yarn is a story. But even more forbidding, it seemed to Jack, were stories told of sea captains tempted by a shorter route to the Pacific through the narrow and vile-tempered Strait of Magellan. There, ships were sometimes cracked in two like nuts between the rocky jaws of the passage. More than one brave captain had turned back for the tender mercies of Cape Horn itself. Stuff and nonsense, Praiseworthy would say, even though he believed every word of it. We may hit a bit of inclement weather, gentlemen, but our good captain will give the back of his hand to the Cape. He told me so himself. Why, the wild bull of the sea could navigate these waters with his eyes shut. Well, said Mr. Azariah Jones, I hope he doesn't try that. Suits me fine if he keeps both eyes open and then some. The mountainous Yankee trader wore a muffler tied round his face, as if he had a toothache to keep his ears warm. In the pilot house, Captain Swain studied his charge, charts. The sea raven was like maps. The sea raven was obviously far in the lead, 
but San Francisco was yet a long way off. Captain Swain knew well enough of the storms lying in wait off the horn, wind that could drive a ship back 20 miles for every one it gained. Nevertheless, the nearer the Lady Wilma crept to the furious tip of the continent, the more eager Captain Swain became. became. They were waters to test a master's skill. Praiseworthy, who was not born to adventure, was surprised to find it decidingly to his liking. His face was weathered. On good days and bad, he took his brisk laps round the deck and enjoyed the sting of the sea on his cheeks. I must admit, he said to Jack, that I'm rather keen on having a look at this notorious cape. You might watch for the fires. Fires? said Jack, attempting to keep up with Praiseworthy's long stride. At Tierra del Fuego. The captain tells me the natives keep great fires going day and night, keep themselves and their sheep from freezing. Tierra del Fuego means land of fire. Yes, that's what it means. A burst of spray rose from the bow and fell like rain. Land of fire, said Jack. I'll watch for it. Almost without warning, the first storm came roaring off the Arctic waste and bore down on the paddle wheeler. The sun went out like a match. Long, shrieking winds loaded with hailstones struck the ship like buckshot. The oak wheels spun out of the hands of the quartermaster. The Lady Wilma went teetering over on her side, digging her ribs deep into the sea. Jack, who had just sat down to a bowl of chowder, saw the bowl fly off in one direction, the chowder in another, and the spoon in a third. I do believe we've arrived at the horn, said Praiseworthy, hanging on to his boiler hat. Captain Swain lent a hand to the wheel, riding the ship and turning her bow sprite to the wind. In the main salon, the gold seekers had been thrown together in a tangle of arms and legs. No sooner did they unravel themselves when another violent lurch of the ship knotted them together again. The ship's bell rang in the wind. Howling blasts ripped off the top of the waves. Riding the swells, the Lady Wilma seemed to climb halfway into the sky, only to drop with a crash into the next trough. Jack got wild glimpses of the sea through a porthole, and he, if he was afraid he was too busy hanging on to give it much thought. The side wheeler burrowed into the storm. Seawater came rushing along the decks and slipped down the hatches like so many waterfalls. Sailors in their stocking caps were busy everywhere, battening the hatches and taking in every rag of canvas. A mere squall, said Praiseworthy, holding on to a post with a hook of his black umbrella. Why, in these latitudes, this is considered a fine spring day, I believe. The weather lasted more than a week. For a day or two, seabirds came out of the sky and rode the yard arms. The gold seekers emerged from their cabin, bruised and sleepless and hungry. Some said it was harder to eat than sleep, and others said it was harder to sleep than eat. But hardly had the seas calmed when another gale burst from the sky. Captain Swain no longer left the pilot house. The nights were now 16 hours long, and the days a mere glimmer of light. The Lady Wilma continued westing, fighting for every foot of water, her paddle wheels thrashing hour after hour, day by day. Being experienced hands, Praiseworthy and Jack helped keep the fire roaring in the furnace. Despite the crash and thunder of the sea, the butler seemed unafraid, and Jack found comfort at being at his side. Whale oil lamps flickered in the passageways, days, and day and night, and it was hard to tell one from the other. The nights were the worst. Jack's hammock swayed to the cabin walls. Mr. Azariah Jones wasn't pitched out of his bunk, it was Dr. Buckby. More than once, Mountain Jim awoke to find them both sprawled across him. I've known grizzly bears that were a mite friendlier than this billy behind Cape Horn. Headwinds battled the paddle wheeler to a complete standstill, and Jack began to wonder if they would ever reach the Pacific. The Lady Wilma was thrashing with all her steam to stay in one place. But then a calm would set in, like a great practical joke. The moment passengers began to snore in their cabins, fresh winds would swoop down and jerk the ship awake. There'll be nothing to do but sleep when we reach the Pacific. Oh, that's praiseworthy. There'll be nothing to do but sleep when we reach the Pacific, praiseworthy pointed out. The portholes were almost frozen over. 
and only once did Jack get a glimpse of land to starboard. Dark cliffs seemed to hang like draperies from the misty sky, and then the weather closed in again, and they were gone. Do you think there's any chance we might catch up with the sea raven? Jack asked, hanging on to his hammock. We could pass within a hundred yards of each other without knowing it, Praiseworthy said. We can't get to San Francisco soon enough to suit me, put in Mr. Ezariah Jones. I hope we win, said Jack. I don't think Captain Swain has the slightest intention of losing, said Praiseworthy. For 37 days, the sidewinder, sidewheeler battled and rammed her way through the crashing headwinds that attempted to drive her back. And then, on a Tuesday morning, the sun broke out, clear and sharp, and hung like an ornament in the northern sky. One by one, the deck hatches opened, and the gold seekers came on deck as if from some dark dungeon. Their eyes blinked in the unfamiliar brightness of the day. We've made it, yelled Mountain Jim, throwing down his yellow fur cap. Boys, this here is the Pacific Ocean. A yell went up around the ship, and Captain Swain leaned out of the pilot house. His beard had grown an inch. He gave a hearty wave and then came out on the paddle box with his long glass, his telescope. After a moment of sweeping the seas, he stopped. By grabs, he roared, there she is, the sea raven and she's astern of us. Another yell went up, and the gold seekers rushed to the after deck for a look, and there was the sea raven indeed, trailing far behind. It seemed to Jack the most exciting moment of his life. A remarkable performance, said Praiseworthy, but he was baffled. It seemed hardly possible that the Lady Wilma had charged ahead against the furies of the past 37 days, and yet there stood the sea raven, behind them as proof. I watched for the fires, said Jack, but I never did catch sight of them, praiseworthy. Suddenly, the butler's eyes lit up. Why, Master Jack, you solved it. Solved what? You didn't see the fires of Tierra del Fuego because they weren't to be seen. But you said, I mean to say the fires were there, but we weren't. At that moment, Captain Swain had joined the gold seekers on the after deck. Jack had never seen him with such a wide, merry grin, glowing from the depths of his whiskers. I hope you gentlemen enjoyed your passage around the horn, said the wild bull of the seas. Captain, Praiseworthy said with a gleam in his eye, Master Jack appears to be on to your secret. What's that? We haven't been around the horn, sir. Captain Swain gave Jack a twinkling glance. Is that so, lad? All I said was, said Jack, what he means is that you have pulled off a most daring piece of seamanship, sir, interrupted the butler. The reason Master Jack didn't catch sight of the great fires at the land's end, why, the reason, sir, is that you took the Lady Wilma through the deadly Strait of Magellan. The Strait of Magellan, you say? The captain rubbed his plump nose. Why, that's a regular ship's graveyard. And then he gave Jack a heavy squint. Of course, it cuts hundreds of miles off the voyage round the horn. Hundreds of miles. A ship's master can be sorely tempted. You mean to say, sir, said Mr. Ezariah Jones, turning white, that we've been bouncing around in that awful place? I confess, chuckled the captain. The lad here has found me out. And then he pointed to the sea raven. Look at her, following us, gentlemen, like a chick after a hen. Wow, he did it. He cut off the very tip of South America by going through the Straits of Magellan. And because of that, he's ahead of the Sea Raven. He caught up to her and he's barely ahead of her now. What a wild ride that must have been. 37 days of that boat just, whew, I think I would have gotten seasick. That was a good chapter. Well, tune in next time for chapter six. Adios, my friends.